thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'll apologize in advance, this is not a very image-rich lecture. Um, I'm gonna cover something that I think is very straightforward, and that is thyroid fine needle aspiration, a very nice and easy technique, and something that I think is very complicated, and that's the understanding of cytology and what it means for patient management. I have no relevant financial relationships. Just like to highlight a couple things about technique in our lab, we do this as low key as possible to minimize patient anxiety. We just use aseptic technique and clean the skin with chlorhexidine liquid, Hibiclens. It's a wonderful antiseptic soap and a wonderful ultrasound coupling agent, so there's actually no need for gel. Very rarely do we give anesthesia. Um, we generally use 27 gauge needles and it's been proven that uh, the finer the needle, generally the, uh, the better the specimen. Occasionally you may have a non-diagnostic aspirate. We have the benefit of on-site cytology or very, um, a very fibrotic nodule, in which case we may go to a 25 or a 23 gauge needle. But the specimen is all about how you're moving the needle in the thyroid uh, nodule per se, and you want to really move this very briskly. It's the cutting bevel of the needle that's acquiring the specimen. We're not truly aspirating. What we do is pull the plunger back in the syringe, which is just a handle, to about one cc, and that gives a little bit of capillary action and brings the material into the needle. The key thing is, targeting suspicious areas, particularly calcified and solid mural nodules, and if you have larger nodules, nodules larger than 4CM, making sure you sample all different parts of the nodules to avoid a, a, a sampling error bias. And here's just a predominantly cystic nodule with a small solid excrescence. You can beautifully target that solid area, and this was a cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma. Dwell time, how long do you stay in? About two to five seconds. You should move your hand back and forth at about three oscillations per second. And we very, very rarely use core biopsy in our lab, but others have some success with that. I'd like to move on to the cytology and ultimately molecular marker analysis, which I think is quite nuanced and as you'll see, ever changing with some new things that literally happened last week at the American Thyroid Association meeting. So prior to 2008, the cytologist basically could render a diagnosis of non-diagnostic, not enough cells, and notice how the risk of cancer is not zero. This is not a benign aspirate, this is non-diagnostic, and usually you repeat this. Benign means benign in the vast majority of cases, but there's a small false negative rate. Malignant should be malignant in nearly all cases. But this middle ground, the so-called indeterminate biopsy, was quite a dilemma for managing the patient with reported incidence of cancer all over the place, 15 to 75%, not very helpful. Patients would typically be referred for surgery, what's been called a diagnostic lobectomy. In essence, surgery to remove that indeterminate nodule with the vast majority of those being benign. So clearly you're exposing these patients to the risk and cost and so forth of surgery only to wind up with a benign diagnosis in the vast majority. But certain patients were being referred for, referred for a total thyroidectomy in our institution as our cytologists were noticing that that, inde that that indeterminate category probably could be further broken down. And in fact, Zubair Baloch, one of our pathologists at our institution, led the, the Bethesda classification, which was adopted in 2008 to do just that. So Bethesda 1 is non-diagnostic, 2 is benign, and 6 is malignant. We've discussed those, but they added these categories. Bethesda 5, suspicious for malignancy. Bethesda 3, phallus, follicular lesion of uncertain significance. And then Bethesda 4, follicular neoplasm. Suspicious for malignancy means there's features very worrisome for papillary thyroid carcinoma, but not outright. Three means there's more atypia than you usually see. Most of these will be benign, a handful will be a cancer, and most will be a follicular variant of papillary cancer. And Bethesda 4, monotonous sheets of follicular cells, most of these are benign adenomas. So the beauty of this is it now aligns with a very much more precise risk of malignancy based on these classifications in order to guide management. Putting this into play, as I mentioned, non-diagnostic, you repeat the biopsy, benign, you observe, again pointing out the risk of cancer is not zero, but it's low, and malignancy, you do a total thyroidectomy. And so we're left with these, again, indeterminate, Bethesda 3 through, through 5, with these newly assigned risk of cancer, what to do. 
In our institution, we repeat floss times one. This is not the practice everywhere, and let me show you why. This is data from Vanderlein, but our institutional experience is very similar. Floss on the first biopsy, the patient comes back about four to six weeks later, we repeat the biopsy, almost half are now benign. We handle those as benign and we just follow them. About 28% will come back flus the second time. And interestingly, in their series and in our series, this is a pretty high risk of cancer. Many of these are follicular variants of papillary cancer. And so we think about flus times two differently than flus times one. So back to that grid here, we have flus times one, flus times two, follicular neoplasm, and suspicious for malignancy. We're a little stuck here because now we have to recommend observation and surgery. And if we recommend surgery, half the thyroid or the entire thyroid. So there was a need to go beyond the cytology. There can be tests that can be added, which can be considered either as a rule-out test or a rule-in test. A rule-out test is a test where you want to better predict a benign outcome for your patient because you're going to suggest observation and not surgery. A rule-in test is you know you're recommending the patient have surgery, but wouldn't it be nice to know if you should refer them for a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy? So enter molecular testing. Molecular testing comes in a variety of different, very innovative uh, methods, including gene expression-based, gene mutation-based oncogenes, microRNA, or a combination. And let me just highlight a few. A test that we have very commonly used is so-called AFIRMA. AFIRMA is a gene expression classifier, which basically takes the, the material from the thyroid nodule and looks to see what genes are being expressed. Failure to express genes associated with, with cancer in cytologically indeterminate nodules has a very high negative predictive value. So if you're thinking that this particular patient would be an observation candidate, a negative gene expression classifier adds a low, confers a lower risk of malignancy when it's negative and reaffirms this, uh, this plan of observing the patient. This was the landmark paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Eric Alexander out of the Brigham, and they showed for a tipia plus, Bethesda 3 and Bethesda 4, a very high negative predictive value with the gene expression classifier. But notice that the negative predictive value is not high enough in this suspicious for malignancy category to avoid surgery. So a very good rule out test. This was put into play. This is a paper published by Dan Duick, who's an, an endocrinologist, and he looked at the impact from his practice upon recommending surgery versus recommending follow-up for patients who had a benign affirma. Prior to that, 74 of his 368 patients would have been recommended for surgery, but now he was only sending eight patients with a benign affirma. And you may be thinking, why is he sending these eight patients? And that's because Dan is a super smart guy and a great ultrasound uh, operator, and there may be features that made him refer patients to surgery, even with a negative affirma, and I'll highlight that in just a moment. Now, there's a big misconception about what does a suspicious GEC mean? The, re the results come back as benign, no genes expressed, or, sus or suspicious, quote, genes expressed. Well, if we look at the best 11 papers that have looked at this and the risk of malignancy with a positive or a suspicious test, the risk of malignancy of patients that went, excuse me, the rate of malignancy these patients were all operated on based on a positive test is all over the map. The New England Journal actual incidence is low, 38% and 37%, and can be as low as 15%. So you want to remember that a suspicious affirma is not suspicious cytology. You have the cytology in hand, usually FLUS or FN, and now you know that some genes are expressed, but still the vast majority of these are not cancerous. That's a common misconception. And why is this? Well, remember that these genetic tests are modifiers. The cytology drives this, and then within a cytologic category, there are people who have a higher risk and lower risk. And that is influenced by a variety of things, including your cytologist at your institution, which are giving you the feedback on site about which tests to do, the cancer rate in your specific population of patients, which may be quite different than that New England Journal article. I've heard clinicians say it's always a 5% negative predictive Value, and that's not true. That was true for the whole cohort at the New England Journal with their cancer prevalence and their cytologists. And the one thing I'd like to highlight specifically is ultrasound appearance. 
So both of these nodules came back with a Bethesda 3 or FLUS cytology result. This one on the top, solid hypoechoic calcified funny margins, and this one on the bottom, fairly innocuous looking. Do these nodules have the same risk of cancer? Of course not. The nodule on the top has a very high risk of cancer, and as a matter of fact, a number of studies show that if you have just one suspicious feature, your risk of cancer with a FLUS cytology is over 70%. Again, many of these are follicular variants of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So this particular patient's risk is well over 70%. This patient is a surgical patient. Even if that affirma came back negative, this patient is still surgery. There's no role for a rule out test. We've already decided to do the surgery. Let's make pretend this is a 100-year-old patient with comorbidities and a very innocuous looking nodule, a very good candidate to lower that patient's specific risk. So in our particular lab, this is how we view it, that if it is a GEC negative nodule that's a low risk patient, no suspicious findings, a smaller nodule, and the patient is willing to undergo observation, a firma, a rule out test is a very good test for those types of nodules. Let's talk a little bit about the gene mutation-based test, and these are the ones that are gaining traction. These can be oncogene panels, and now often in combination with the RNA component, and I'll do my best to explain that a little bit as well. These tests first splashed on the scene in about 2010, and the genetics of thyroid cancer is known very well. A number of oncogenes and gene mutations have been identified that are found in thyroid carcinoma, and I've listed the vast majority of them here. What's interesting, though, is that these original tests, first generation, had relatively low sensitivity, and I'll explain that, and only moderate specificity. The sensitivity part can be thought of as follows, that BRAF mutation, which is seen in papillary thyroid cancers, if you know you have a BRAF mutation, you know you have a cancer. But remember, we're not dealing with positive cytology. We're dealing with indeterminate cytology. Many of these are either non-cancerous or their follicular variant of papillary cancer, which do not tend to have the BRAF mutation. They more commonly have KRAS, NRAS, and so forth. So the incidence of having a BRAF mutation in nodules that have indeterminate cytology is very low. Additionally, we have overlap, and that is some of these oncogenes are expressed both in adenomas and in follicular type cancers, the NRAS, the KRAS, and so forth. So it's a very, very complicated, um, very, very complicated background here. The two most common oncogene panels that are out there now um, start with the thyroid genex that we talked about, but Interspace has added the micro -R uh, mRNA as well, and this is called thyroid MIR. Um, if both of these tests are negative, that negative predictive value is very high, but only a moderate positive predictive value. So a very strong rule out test, moderately strong, strong rule in test. Thyroseq version two, and this is important as I'll explain in a, in a moment, comes out of Nikiforov's lab at University of Pittsburgh, who's one of the leaders in this field. And uh, this particular test in their population at Pittsburgh had wonderful sensitivity and specificity. But when it was tested in other populations that had a lower risk, and, excuse me, a lower rate of cancer in the cohort, it did a little bit less well, but the negative predictive value held up. This was a paper that looked at the difference between Moffitt Cancer Institute and UPMC, and you can see the black here is Pitt, and their population, the positive predictive value for cancer when that test was positive was relatively high, but among FLUS lesions at Moffitt, not a very high positive predictive value. However, hot off the press, right from the ATA presented last week is the latest version of Thyroseq soon to be released. This will be Thyroseq version three. So we all now, if those of you who are using it are using version two that has this profile, but as the test gets better and better over time, the positive predictive value will be higher. There was just a multi-institutional multi study that was presented there and should be published soon. So I believe that moving forward, Thyroseq three will have both a very high negative predictive value and a much higher positive predictive value and can serve as both a rule-in and a rule-out test. So molecular testing is very complicated, but it's very useful in certain scenarios. It's useful if you want to prescribe observation to a patient and you want to use the negative predictive value to do that. If the surgery would be altered by the test, then it's worthwhile to do it. But if your surgeon already knows they're going to do a complete thyroidectomy, it may not be worth the expense to do it.
And let me finish up with either a further complication. Not all cancer is created equal. You may have heard of this entity called the NIFTP, a non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. In essence, it is a cancer because the nuclear features say it's a cancer, but its biological behavior is very non-aggressive, much more like an adenoma. Now some of the surgeons are very satisfied to only do a hemithyroidectomy and leave it at that. You're gonna get a positive cytology, they'll do the hemi, they may not go back to do the completion. So this is hot off the, the press of the ThyroSeq website that you can look at, and now we can actually offer very tailored therapy based on the results. So no mutations, the risk of cancer is low, very close to benign cytology. If it's positive, but it's only RAF positive, it could be a cancer, but it could be a non-aggressive of cancer, a lobectomy would be fine. And if it's BRAF positive or has multiple mutations, it's probably a cancer. And you can actually see with multiple, it's probably a high-risk cancer. And maybe that surgeon would, in addition to do the, the total thyroidectomy, do a prophylactic neck resection. So I think it's a very complicated topic that's obviously evolving with the ATA just presenting this data last week. Um, but I hope that my synopsis has been helpful. Thank you.